All right, in this video, uh, we're going to talk about population growth models, and we'll discuss reproductive strategies of K-selected and R-selected species. The growth rate refers to the number of offspring a population can produce in a given time period, minus the deaths of the population during the same period. Take a look at our equation. Growth rate is equal to births minus deaths. Now, deaths, if it's larger than births, our growth rate can be a negative number, uh, implying that the population size would be decreasing. We can figure out uh, what the growth rate is by looking at a graph. Imagine for a moment that I put a dot right here on this line and drew a tangent line through that dot. Uh, the slope of that tangent line would be the growth rate at that moment. And the larger the slope number, the, uh, the larger the growth rate. Compare that to, imagine if I put a dot right here and then drew a tangent line through it, uh, through that dot. The tangent line would have a slope of zero. Um, so we can, again, determine the growth rate by looking at and determining the slope of the line at any one of those points. So let's talk about population growth models. The first one that we'll talk about here is exponential growth. And this is what an exponential growth curve or a J curve looks like. It's called a J curve because take a look, this red line kind of looks like the letter J, right? Uh, time is in the X axis and population numbers is on the left. And so you have to kind of imagine what's happening here in this population. We have a, a smaller population in this section of the graph. Uh, but hey, those individuals are reproducing and producing their own offspring too. Those offspring over time, it depends on the species of how long this takes, but the uh, population, the, the offspring will be able to start to reproduce on their own, creating their own offspring. And so over time then, we start to increase that population exponentially as more and more of those offspring produce their own offspring, which in turn create their own offspring, and on and on it goes. Uh, take a look at the difference here between the different sections. In the beginning of uh, exponential growth, if I put a dot right where my mouse is, um, I'm going to and then draw a tangent line through it. I'm going to have a pretty shallow uh, slope line. Compare that to if I put a dot right here and through, uh, drew a tangent line through that, I would have a lot steeper. Uh, so we can start to say and, and notice that the uh, population growth rate will continue to increase and increase and increase as time goes by. So this is called the exponential growth model or a J-shaped or J-curve. Um, this will happen because populations have ample resources, right? They're living at their biotic potential. Um, all of their needs are being met. There's plenty of food, there's plenty of water, nutrients available, uh, habitat and space, uh, partners and, and uh, other individuals with whom to reproduce. Now this type of growth here absolutely can happen in the wild, but it won't be sustainable, right? This type of growth is not sustainable in ecology. Uh, and the reason why for that is because, hey, those limiting resources, they're called limiting resources for a reason. There's only so much of them, right? Resources are finite. When I say resources, I'm talking about food, nutrients, space, habitat, partners, right? Um, so over time then, what we're gonna see actually is that exponential growth will start to slow down. And so uh, we've got a different or another type of model here. And this is called the logistic growth curve or the logistic growth model. And if you look here, this green line, it's it kind of looks like the letter S. And so we call it an S-shaped curve or an S-curve. I think though that the S actually stands for sigmoidal curve, which is what the shape of this line is. Uh, there's that word biotic potential again, right? Uh, take a look. This is the logistic growth model. It's an S-shaped curve. So uh, we're going to see exponential growth in the very beginning of the logistic growth model, um, right? As that uh, population is growing and living at their biotic potential, their populations are increasing, just as I mentioned on the prior slide, right? Biotic potential, let's put this into our notes, is the maximum reproductive capacity of a population under optimum environmental conditions. 
I'll say it again. Meiotic potential refers to the maximum reproductive capacity of an organism under optimum environmental conditions. This, again, is a species or population is living at its biotic potential if uh, their needs are being met, right? If, hey, everything's working out, they're getting plenty of food, um, plenty of, uh, uh, of opportunities to reproduce, and everyone's healthy, there's no disease. Now, like I said before, that exponential growth in our, our world will start to slow, and you can kind of see that, right? Think about the slope of this line in this section of the graph compared to the slope of the line over here in this section of the graph, right? That slope is kind of like actually this orange line that goes across right there, right? Think about the slope of zero compared to a slope of uh, a lot more over here. So higher, fa uh, faster or higher growth rate in this section, and then zero to little growth rate in this section. So that bionic potential is wanting to increase the population size, but there's environmental resistance that is pushing down and preventing that growth from happening forever, right? That environmental resistance is going to slow population growth until the population size reaches its carry capacity. Carrying capacity is the number of organisms that an ecosystem can support without environmental degradation. Um, that environmental resistance is going to be density dependent regulation. So that's gonna be the access to the limiting resources like water, space, habitat, food, nutrients, even predation, competition, disease, and parasites, right? Waste accumulation is on another way that um, population size can, uh, population growth rather can slow, uh, right? Hey, density dependent regulation is uh, what is controlling that, right? Slowing down that growth rate. Hey, so uh, one thing that could happen, just a couple little definitions here. Uh, there's uh, overshoots and die-offs that could happen in some populations. Uh, we saw this with the kebab a deer in Arizona, that extreme overshoot above carrying capacity, followed by uh, a massive starvation event that happened that die off of the population, right? So populations might overshoot carrying capacity and experience a die off as available resources will vary over time, right? So uh, it kind of like what some species, like maybe mosquitoes, would might might see this too, right? We'll, we'll overshoot the maximum carrying capacity. And then imagine like, I don't know, a drought, right? Mosquitoes need water in order to reproduce. And so if there's a drought, there's less water for them to reproduce in, and we might see an extreme die-off, a massive die-off in that population in uh, these kind of roller coaster of life as it moves forward. Species fill their niches using different reproductive strategies. Think about the different reproductive strategies here that the elephant has adapted to versus, well, let's say the quagga mussel, which is what you're seeing on the right. The quagga mussel is an invasive species. Uh, the quagga mussel is currently impacting the Lake Mead uh, by attaching itself to different surfaces, including like the intake towers at the Hoover Dam. Uh, it's expensive to have to get all of this stuff off, but uh, most importantly, it's taking up habitat space from native species that normally would live in Lake Mead. It's now being uh, taken up by the invasive quagga mussel. But to get back to my, my point here about reproductive strategies and the adaptations that different species will use to fill their niche, uh, an elephant might have one calf per season versus one of these quagga mussels producing one million or more larvae uh, uh, offspring uh, in, in order to fulfill their niche or fill it. Uh, so there's just different reproductive strategies and reasons why organisms might want to um, to reproduce differently, right? It's, uh, well, elephants are a little bit larger. They live a lot longer than the quagga mussel. It takes a long time for this little calf to reach reproductive age. And so there's this idea then that the larger adult is going to protect, right? Maybe have some parental care for the calf such that it won't be killed off through predation and it will reach reproductive age so that that population can continue to grow. Quagga mussels, on the other hand, don't live as long. They produce millions of larvae, a lot more offspring, but most of those offspring might end up just being food for other organisms on the food web, right? Not all one million of them might plant themselves down on a rock or on a 
intake tower at the Hoover Dam. Uh, so we'll talk more about those traits in a moment. Um, take a look, we've got some definitions. So uh, we're going to call these elephants, uh, humans, whales, we call them case-selected species. You might also see them as case strategists. The letter K refers to carrying capacity. So this is a reproductive strategy of a population of species controlled by density-dependent regulation. So we'll see these case-selected species oftentimes at K, right? Slowing down that growth rate such that they are at carrying capacity, which again was where that letter K comes from. Density-dependent regulation, that environmental resistance from predation and competition, access to limiting resources is what will slow that growth. And you see some examples of different case strategists here. Larger mammals tend to be case strategists, but not all mammals are necessarily. We'll talk more about that when we get into uh, the concept on day 10. So just as there are uh, different species that are controlled by density dependent regulation, there are also different types of species that are controlled by density independent regulation, like that mosquito that I mentioned earlier. An R selected species or an R strategist is a reproductive strategy of a population of species controlled by density independent regulation. Kind of mentioned about what could cause a massive die off of a mosquito population, right? Mm -hmm. That natural event, drought, is a way that we can decrease the population size. And it's not really has anything to do with the density of the population, right? It's just a natural phenomenon that happens. Um, so our selected species include mosquitoes, dandelions, barnacles, those quagga mussels, and weeds. Take a look, you can uh, push pause on the video to copy this uh, list of traits of case-selected and R-selected species into your notes. Uh, take a look, right? Uh, the case-selected species tend to have longer lifespans versus the R-selected that have shorter. Uh, it takes longer to reach reproductive maturity in case-selected species, uh, a lot shorter in our selected species. Take a look here. I'm going to uh, get down to parental care is present within case selected and absent in our selected. So think about this, right? Because the life is so long and because it takes a little bit longer to reach reproductive age in a case selected species, it might be important to have parents there to ensure that the one or two calves in the case of elephants continue to live to reach reproductive maturity. Why is that important? Well, because there's um, fewer reproductive events in a case-selected species compared to many within the R-selected. Fewer offspring. So it's important then that there's parental care versus many, right? If we're a quagga mussel and we're sending out a million larvae, um, there, there's no way that uh, parents can, can handle the million offspring, right? They just kind of assume that uh, they're going to go off and, and uh, live to their biotic potential. Many will die likely as a result of, um, of predation, right? But yeah, larger offspring, more resources that go into ensuring that that individual lives long enough to be able to reproduce. And because our selected species are so smaller, uh, so much smaller, it's uh, they're, uh, they take up fewer resources as a result, right? Take a look here. Population regulation is going to be dependent on the density for K-selected, and then it will be independent here for our selected species. We'll see those massive die-offs as a result of natural processes like floods, uh, fires. Population dynamics. Uh, K-selected species will reach carrying capacity as environmental resistance pushes down their growth. Uh, so there, once we're at carrying capacity, that population will be relatively stable unless a new disease comes in and, you know, massive die-off as a result. But yeah, our selected species is a little bit more of that roller coaster where we'll see those extreme shoot, overshoots and then extreme die-offs moving forward. Um, hey, invasive species tend to be our selected species. Um, it's important to note that invasive species are invasive in their new habitat, but in their native habitat, they're just a, you know, they're being controlled likely by density dependent regulation, right? There might be a predator that is keeping their numbers in check, but when you take an invasive species out of its native habitat and put it into an area where 
all of its needs are being met, plus there's no more predation or there's no more disease that was keeping their numbers down below, they really can skyrocket. And when you combine it with some of the traits like the number of offspring, imagine for a moment that the quagga mussel produces a million larvae in their native hab habitat, um, right? That those numbers will be controlled. Organisms will eat them up. But when you put quagga mussel into a new environment where all of its needs can be met and there's no more control as to how many organisms there are in the area, right? External control factors. Then maybe more, more of those million larvae will actually transplant themselves onto different surfaces, right? They're able to outcompete the native species because they're that much more adapted to living in warmer water or uh, more space or less disease, right? Kind of interesting. In fact, that's kind of going into your homework for tonight. What I'd like you to do is check out your homework assignment on Canvas under day nine and be prepared to share this, uh, your, your, um, your work uh, in some form during our next session on day 10.